Okay. All right. Oh, where am I at? I am not there. I just minimized that. Okay. Since I'm using a different screen. Okay. So I tried to record this uh, the other day and I got through it, but it just so happened that. Uh, there I am. Okay. It just so happened that it recorded, but nothing showed on the screen. Yeah. So I probably threw a couple things and then just quit for the moment. So here we are again, trying this over. I hope it records correctly. I still have everything written down in the notes, so maybe it could go through faster uh, if I just explain what I wrote down, right? So here we go again. This is 7.2. A set is a collection of objects. Each object is called an element. Sets are, sets are usually denoted by capital letters. Elements are denoted by lowercase letters. The table below is, shows all the notation we need for sets. So starting off, braces denote a set. So whatever goes inside the brace makes the set, right? So braces denote a set. Then you come to the funny looking notation. That lovely little looking E there means element of, right? So this little E or E looking symbol, right? This means element of. So element of. Oh, come on. Show up. Okay, well, my writing will show up soon. Okay, so that means A is an element of set A. And with that being said, for example, four is an element of the set of numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So this is true. The next one, A with that funny looking E symbol with the line through it means not an element of. So we say A is not an element of A, set A. So there's that. So if we did the example, eight would not be an element of the set of numbers one through six, just because A is not in there, right? A is not in there. All right. And then to denote the empty set, meaning there's nothing there or just nothing belongs. The empty set means that the set of all we want to, for example, the set of all values greater than 10 on a six-sided die. Well, on a six-sided die, there are no values greater than 10. So this would be the empty set because it just doesn't exist. That doesn't exist. Okay. The next notation would be, uh, the set of all values of x such that p of x is true. So for example, the set of all values of x such that x is on a six-sided die. And x could be any number on the six-sided die, one through six. So this is just a true statement. Okay, the next one is a complement. Okay, so a complement or complement of a is all the numbers that are not in set a. So for example, looking at all positive integers less than 10, if set A is 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, then a complement would be 2, 4, 6, 8. The other elements that are in less than 10. So those are not in set A. And then N of A, the number of elements in set A, meaning if set A has elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, there are six numbers in there, which means there are six elements in set A. So that's what we use here. Okay, moving on. Let me see, is this syncing? Let's see, sync, sync, uh, this notebook. There we go, now we're on it. Okay, good, element of, right? That's what I wrote. Okay. So now we're given a bunch of sets. We are given u, which is the universal set, and u is all positive integers less than 10. So u is a set of numbers one through nine. Let set a be odd positive integers less than 10. So set a would be one, three, five, seven, nine. And the complement of a would be all even integers that are less than 10, two, four, six, eight. B 
even positive integers less than 10. B is 2, 4, 6, 8. This means that B complement would be the set of all odd integers less than 10, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Or B complement could also be set A. All right. Let's see B prime numbers less than 10. So set C is 2, 3, 5, 7, which means C complement is going to be every other number less than 10 that is not prime. 1, 4, 6, 8, 9. All right, U is the universal set and it contains all the elements. Uh, a Venn diagram is a picture that represents all possible outcomes by sorting the elements into sets. So a Venn diagram for set A would be that since set A is in the universal set, A contains one, three, five, seven, nine from the above, and then the rest of the elements outside of A are two, four, six, eight. So they all belong in the universal set because the universal set is all numbers less than 10. All right. And then a Venn diagram for the number of elements in set A. Well, set A has 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, meaning it has five elements. So there are five elements in set A, and there are four elements outside of set A. So altogether, the universal set has nine elements. So that five plus that four gives us the nine elements in the universal set. Whew. All right. Lots of talking. Okay. Uh, the outer rectangle represents U, the universal set. Elements in A are also contained in the universal set. So I've said that already. The set contains all elements in either set, which is called a union. A key word to denote union is the word or. The set that contains only the elements common to both sets is called an intersection. A key word to denote an intersection is the word and. Okay, let's keep going. So union would combine all the elements. An intersection only wants the elements that it has in common, the elements that the sets will share. OK, so we want to say set A union set C, meaning we want elements in set A or set C. So we want all the elements together. So if we look up at the top, set A was 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Set C was 2, 3, 5, 7. So when we combine these two sets, you're going to get 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 9, which means we get six total elements inside the set. Now we say A intersects C. Elements, we only want elements that are both in sets A and C. So we only want the elements that they share in common. So if we scroll back up, we see that set A is 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Set C is 2, 3, 5, 7. We see that set A and C have elements 3, 5, 7 in common. So since those are the common elements, this means that the intersection of A and C will be those common elements 3, 5, 7, which means there are three elements in the intersection of A and C. All right. Down below, like I said, I already wrote on this, so. I'm just going to explain what I covered. If I need to redraw it, I'll redraw it again. OK, so it says construct a Venn diagram for sets A and C, listing the elements in their correct location. OK, so there is set A, which has 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. And then there's set C, which has 2, 3, 5, 7. We see that the intersection of these two sets has the elements 3, 5, and 7, only because 3, 5, and 7 are the elements that these sets have in common. So if you were to have, hold your hands just over circle A, right? If you were to hold your hands over circle A, like if I could even draw a hand on here or show it, right? I could just blank it out for a second. So let's say you ignored all of this. And set A would just be 1, 9, 3, 5, 7. Don't make me constantly sync this. Come on. Let's see, sync. There we go. Okay, so if you ignored that, then you're only looking at set A, one, three, five, seven, right? But then if you said, okay, let's ignore A, then you would get set C, which would be. just two, three, five, seven. So that's what we want to do there. Okay, 
perfect. I don't know, you're supposed to sync automatically. Okay, perfect. If not, I'll switch to my actual laptop where I can control it. Okay. So then it says construct a Venn diagram for the sets A and C, listing the number of elements. So there's A, and in set A, there are five elements. So there are two elements which C does not, which do not belong to C, and there are three elements which A and C share. So again, if you put your hand over just uh, set A, you would have five elements, which it has. If you put your hand over set A, then set C would have four elements, three and one. So there is a Venn diagram for the number of elements. All right. So A union C, if you combine all the elements together, you would have six elements. A intersect C, you would only have the number in the middle, which is three elements, but which are in the intersection. So the Venn diagrams represent the table above. That's all we did there. Okay. Perfect. Then Construct a Venn diagram for sets A and B, listing the elements in their correct locations. So for this Venn diagram, set A is 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, set B is 2, 4, 6, 8. You see how these circles are not intersecting. And the reason they're not intersecting is because they have no elements in common. A is 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, B is 2, 4, 6, 8. So they do not intersect. So down below, a union B is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It is all the sets, all the elements combined from both sets. A intersect B, since these do not intersect, this means that we have the empty set. And to represent the empty set, you use the symbol, the circle with the line through it, or you use empty braces. Okay, that's it. We do not write, we do not write the empty set of the empty set. Hey, look, there we go. Oh, there's one. Where's the other one? Okay. Technical difficulties on the very last lesson of the semester, right? Oh, man. Okay, sync. I'll just switch it to my laptop. That might be better. Okay, so again, we do not write the empty set of the empty set because that just doesn't make sense. And you'll probably create some uh, time space warp, warp holes. So we don't want to do that, okay? So no empty set of the empty set. Just empty set or an empty set of braces. Okay, that's it. Well, I didn't see my cameras freaking out. Great. Good stuff today. This lesson just doesn't want to be filmed. <laughs> okay. So, and then there's a Venn diagram for sets A and B for the, for the number of elements. So set A has five elements. Uh, set B has four elements. So the union of A and B just for the number of elements is nine elements total, five plus four. And the intersection of AB, since they do not intersect, we have zero elements in there, so no elements. So since this wants elements, we write zero. We don't write the empty set for this one. Okay, perfect. All right, let's keep going, all right. Note the differences in the Venn diagrams for A and C, then for A and B. Sets A and B have no intersection, so A and B are said to be disjoint. Their sets are not joined at any part, so they are disjoint. Okay, well, with that being said, using the Venn diagram above, let's answer some questions. All right, so we wanna know just what are the number of elements in these sets? So what is the number of elements in the universal set? So the number of elements in the universal set, well, you just add up all the elements there. 17 plus 52 plus nine plus 22, there are 100 elements, right? 
what are the number of elements in A? That would be 17 plus 52. That would give us 69 elements. What are the number of elements in set B? That would be 9 plus 52, which we get 61 elements. What are the number of elements in the intersection of A and B? That would just be 52. What are the number of elements in A union B? That would be 17 plus 52 plus 9, so 78. What are the number of elements in B complement? That would be 39, meaning that would be everything outside of set B. So that would be 17 plus 22, 39. And what are the number of elements in complement A? That would be everything that is not in set A. So that would be 9 plus 22, that would be 31. Okay, perfect. All right, so there it is. Not bad. Maybe you just need a little explanation to it. All right, so for this one, it would definitely need some explanation. Uh, we're using a contingency table. Okay, let me see. Is this thing on auto sync? Options. One moment, please. Sync notebook automatically. Yes. Okay. Just have to make sure. All right. So using the contingency table, these are the students that were in my business algebra course in summer 2015 by gender. All right, so set B is my first course, which had 14 total students, 10 males, four females. Set S is my second course, which had 18 total students, eight males, 10 females. And together there were 32 students, students total. Okay. So number one says, what are the number of elements in set B? What are the number of elements in the first course? 14, 14 total elements, well, 14 people. Two, what is the number of males, right? How many elements are in the male set? And there are 18 total males. Three, what are the number of elements in the second class? What are the total number of elements? And that is 18. Four. What is the total number of females? 14. Four, what is the number of elements in the first class unioned with the set of females? Okay, so this is where it gets a little bit tricky. We get 28 minus four, so we get 24. Okay, so this means that we take set B, all right, maybe I should switch it. Is it gonna do it? Let me see. Keep up, keep up, keep up. Okay, so we take all the elements in set B and we union them with all the elements in set F for females. So we see that we get 14 plus 14, which gives me 20. Eight. But there's an issue here because we are counting a number twice. So in the first course, we see that I have 10 males, four females for a total of 14 students. Then in the set of females, we say I have four females plus 10 females, we have 14. But what we realize is that we are counting this four twice. We are counting this four twice. Yeah, which means this is why we have to subtract it because we don't want to double count. Okay, so. 28 minus four, because it was double counted, gives us actually 24 elements in the union of the first class with the set of females. All right. Okay. And then five says, what is the number of elements in the intersection of the second class with the number of males. Okay, hang on, let me do this better. All right. 
stop share. There's me. Come back here. Let me share this. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. Okay. And now we're back to normal, right? Okay. Good. All right. So for five, it says the intersection of the second class. So the intersection of the second class with the set of males. So this wants to know what number does it have in common? And that number is going to be eight. So that is our answer there. Okay. Then it says what number six says, the number of elements with the first class union, the second class. So this just wants the total students all together. It wants all the elements together. So that answer would be 32. Then number seven says, the number of elements in the second class intersected with the set of females. So there's the second class. We intersect it with a set of females. And everything is just running slow today. I'm telling you, this lesson does not want to be recorded. <laughs> The screen's not even moving. Oh. Whatever shall I do? Never record this lesson. That's what I'll do. Oh, see? Broken. One moment. Disconnect from my Wi Fi. And reconnect. And there we go. Let's see if we're better. Sorry for all the interruptions. Okay, so seven said the second class intersected with the set of females and we see that the number they have in common happens to be 10. So that's our answer there. Okay, the number eight says, what is the number of elements with the number of business students, with a set of business, not business, with the set of class one intersected with the set of class two. So this means they have to have something in common. But what we're saying is we want the intersection of class one with the intersection of class two. Well, they don't intersect anywhere because they have nothing in common. Because if they had something in common, this means that students from class one could attend class two and vice versa. So this can't happen, which means this is the empty set because these two classes are different and they cannot intersect. So we get the empty set. Okay, nine. Well, this one's just like eight. The intersection of the set of males with the set of females. Now, do the males and females have anything in common? Do these sets intersect? Not at all. So again, we get the empty set. Okay. And then it says 10, the number of students in class one intersected with the set of males. So the number of students in class one intersected with the set of males. So all we want to know is what number they have in common. And that number is 10. And the last one, the number of students in the second class unioned with the set of females. So the number of students in the second class, which is 18, union with the set of females. 
So again, you have 18 students in the first, second class, plus 14 students, or 14 females altogether. But again, we're double counting a number because we already counted the number of females once because they are 10 females in the second class. So this means that 10 is being double counted. So we have to subtract 10, therefore giving us 22. All right. And this may all make sense when we get to the next set of notes, which is right now. Okay. Ooh, it's too small. I'll leave it right there. Okay. So from the very first set of notes from 7.2, we are using the same sets. So you, oh, by the way, this is 7.3 now, if you didn't know. <laughs> U is the set of elements one through nine. A is odd elements, one through one, three, five, seven, nine, which means a complement would be even elements, two, four, six, eight. Uh, B is the even integers, two, four, six, eight, which means B complement would be the odd integers, one, three, five, seven, nine. And then C is your prime numbers less than 10, two, three, five, seven. C complement would be every other number that's not prime and less than 10, one, four, six, eight, nine. Okay. Uh, we want a constructive Venn diagram again for sets A and C, just listing the number of elements. So in set A, there are five elements. So there's the two and the three. In set C, there are four elements, which means you have the three and the one. Now let's answer some questions below. This says, what is the number of elements in A union C? Which means we are just adding up two, three, and one, which gives us six. Then it says, what is the number of elements in the intersection of A and C? And that's going to be three. Then it says, how many elements are in set A? Two plus three, that's five. How many elements are in set C? One plus three, that gives us four. Okay. Now answering more questions below, does the number of elements in A union C equal the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in C? Well, we know that the number of elements in A union C happens to be six. And then the number of elements in A is five and the number of elements in C is four. So we, what we end up with is six, equal to nine. Now, are those two numbers equivalent? No. And why doesn't this work? That's what we want to know. Why doesn't, why aren't these equal? And the reason they're not equal is because A and C actually have numbers in common. A and C are, they intersect, right? So they actually have elements in common. This is why this formula does not work. But what if we did Another formula, which is down below. What if we did the number of elements in A union C is equal to the elements in A plus the elements in C minus the number of elements in A intersect C? Oof, I know it's a lot. So we know that the elements in A union C is six. We know the number of elements in A is five. Elements in C is four and the elements in A intersect C is three. Well, we actually end up this time with six equal to six. So this brings us back to our double counting. So this means that if you have two sets that intersect, well, this means so we don't double count, we'll have to minus that intersection. So if I scroll back up to this contingency table, this would mean that four actually makes more sense now. So four says the intersection of students in class one, not the intersection, the union of students of in class one with the union of the set of females, right? The union of the set of females. So in class one, 
there's 10, 4, and 14, right? And then the set of females, 4, 10, and 14. So this means that these sets share four. So if they were to intersect, they would have four in common, which means that we would have to subtract that four so we don't double count. So we were actually using that formula without even knowing it. We basically just called it double counting. So now hopefully that makes a little more sense. Okay. Now on the right side, construct a Venn diagram for sets A and B, listing the number of elements. So A has five elements, one, three, five, seven, nine, and B has four elements, two, four, six, eight. Well, do A and B have any elements in common? That answer is no. This is why the sets do not intersect, right? They do not intersect. Okay, but then we can still get the number of elements in the union of A and B, which happens to be nine. Five plus four gives me nine. The number of elements in the intersection, these do not intersect, so that number is zero. But we know the number of elements in A is five, and the number of elements in B is four. Okay, moving on. Let's apply these formulas again. Does the union of A and B equal the number of elements in A plus elements in B. So nine is the union of A and B, five and A, four and B. Yes, nine equals nine. This works. Why does it work? Why does this one work and not the other one work? The reason this one works is because they do not intersect, meaning they are disjoint, right? These sets are disjoint. So this is why the formula works. And it even works if we try the second formula. Does A union B equal elements in A plus elements in B minus the elements of the intersection? And that answer is yes. You would get nine equal to five plus four minus zero, which is the number of elements in the intersection. And no matter what, you still get nine equal to nine. So this works only because the sets are disjoint, okay? The sets are disjoint, all right. Ooh, moving on. All right, so now we get a principle for counting. For any two sets A and B, the union of A and B will be equal to uh, number of elements in A plus number of elements in B minus the intersection of A and B. If A and B are just joint, then the intersection, the number of elements in the intersection is zero. Thus, if A and B are disjoint, then the number of elements in A union B is just the number of elements in A plus the number of elements in B. Okay, awesome. Okay, next. A class of 30 music students includes 13 who play guitar, 16 who play piano, and five who play the p both the piano and guitar. How many students in this class play neither instrument? Okay, so you see I have the numbers there. So maybe I can erase these and we could start fresh. Yeah, look at that. Okay, you had the answers up already, right? So there are 30 students all together. 13 play the piano, 16 play the guitar, and five who play both the piano and guitar. So this means that piano and guitar sets will intersect. And the number they have in common is five because five people play both instruments. So that's why that five went in there. And then we know that 13 students play the piano. Well, if there's a five in there, then this means that there must be eight students who just play the piano, which means eight plus five gives us 13 people who play the piano. Okay, and then there are 16 who play the guitar. Well, we know that five can play piano guitar, which means that 11 just play the guitar. So now add these numbers up, eight plus five plus 11. What's that? 13, is that 24? Yes, that's 24. So 24 students all together play an instrument, but we wanna know how many in class play neither instrument. So that would be 
six students. Six students do not play neither instrument. And if you add up all the elements, we get 30. Okay, awesome. So, uh, yeah, perfect. All right, so this is another contingency table. So we're looking at a survey polled that polled 1,280 men and 1,531 women to determine their level of education. The results in the table below uh, ignore the round to all three decimal places because there's nothing to round on this one. Okay, so here we go again. Here we have to set up the uh, operation. So for A, how many females earned a high school diploma? So this means we want the set of females, all the females, But all we want to know is how many females earned a high school diploma. So that means that would be the intersection. So here's the people who earned a high school diploma. But all we want to know are what are the number of females. And that number would be 827. So this would be an intersection because it says how many females earned a high school diploma. So that's the intersection. That's where we get 827 from. Okay. And then how many in the survey are female or, or earn a bachelor's degree? So or is represented by the union. So we would take the set of females again. And then we are going to say or earn a bachelor's degree. So we're going to take the whole set of bachelor's degree. So since these have something in common, they share a common intersection of the number 259. So there are 1,531 females, and there are 507 people who earned a bachelor's degree. But so we don't double count, we subtract 259. And this would equal 1779. So 1,779 people have, are either female or earned a bachelor's degree. Okay, awesome. All right. How many females earned a college degree? This one requires no sets, right? I mean, you could if you wanted to, but this one, the number of females who earned a college degree, you would just add up the associates, the bachelors, and the graduate, which gives me 518. So that would be 518 females who earned a college degree. Okay. How many in the survey are male or earned an associate's degree? So how many in the survey are male? So all the male or earned an associate's degree. So everybody who's earned an associate's degree. So once again, these share a common number of 96, which means you would take the number of males, which is 1280, plus the number of people who earned an associate's degree, which is 224, but you would subtract the number they have in common which is 96, and that would give me 1408. All right, there we go. All right, now we move away from sets and we get into our another counting principle for multiplication. So, a couple plans to have three children. How many possible orderings by gender are there for three children? One method is to list all possible orderings with the tree diagram. So look at this tree diagram. So for the first child, 
you get a choice of boy or girl. So for the first kid, you get two choices. Then for the second kid, you get another two choices, which means that you can have boy, 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 girl, girl, boy, girl, girl. And then for the third kid, you have another two choices. Boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. And with all these choices, you have eight possible orderings of gender for your children. You could have boy, 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 girl, boy, girl, boy, all the way to girl, girl, girl. No matter how you order these, these all spell trouble. Don't have eight kids. I mean, three kids, three children, okay? <laughs> Don't even have eight kids, but whatever. I'm messing. Okay, so the question is, is there a faster way to do this than making a tree diagram? Because imagine down below, what if the couple wanted to have eight children? Then how many possible orderings? Would you want to draw a tree diagram for this situation? Then that answer is no. Imagine how big that tree would be, right? Imagine how big that tree would be. Okay, what we do know is that for the first child, you have two choices. For the second child, you have two choices. For the third child, you have two choices and so on and so on and so on. Each child has two choices for gender, right? Which brings us into the multiplication principle for counting. All right, so if two operations, O1 and O2 are performed in order with N1 possible outcomes for the first operation and N2 possible outcomes for the second operation, then there are N1 times N2 possible combined outcomes of the first operation followed by the second. This can be extended for several n operations, right? Ooh, does any of that make sense? Probably not, but we'll make it make sense when we do this problem below. How many possible orderings are there for a couple wanting eight children? Well, again, two choices for the first one, second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one, sixth one, seventh one, eighth one. So there's two choices for all eight children, which means you have two to the eighth power or 256 possible orderings for your eight children. Boy, 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 girl, 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 or boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, right? So there are 256 possible ways for you to order that. And that's it. That's how the counting principle works. It's a lot faster than having to make a tree. Okay. Three. A delicatessen serves meat sandwiches with the following options. Three kinds of bread, five kinds of meat, and two types of greens, lettuce or sprouts. How many sandwiches are possible assuming that one item is used from each category? So again, like I said, I have everything written down already. So we wanna know how many sandwiches we can make at this uh, delicatessen. So there's three types of bread, five types of meat, two types of greens. So this sandwich shop only allows you 30 possible types of sandwiches. Well, maybe that's them keeping it simple or they just don't want to make money because at Subway, how many ways they say you can make a sandwich there? Like over a million ways? So something to think about for this small shop. Or maybe keeping it simple is easiest. Okay, so there you go. 30 sandwiches at that sandwich shop. Okay, four. Phone numbers without area codes are seven digits. The first digit cannot be zero or one. The last six digits can be any number from zero through nine. Based on these requirements, how many phone numbers are possible within an area code? Okay, so we're trying to make a seven digit phone number and the first digit cannot be zero or one. So we, all, we are only allowed to use digits zero through nine, which means if you add them up, those are 10 digits. So this means that for the very first digit, we cannot choose zero or one, which means two digits are taking away. 
So the very first digits, we can only choose out of eight numbers. And that's where this eight comes from, right? That's where this eight comes from. Because we are only allowed to choose numbers two through nine, which happens to be eight digits. Okay, but for the very last six digits, you can choose any of the digits you want from zero to nine. So that means there are 10 possible choices for the last six digits. So 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 by 10, which gives us eight times 10 to the six. So this means that there are eight million possible choices to make your phone number. Or you just have the best pickup line ever. You're like, girl, I know there's eight million phone numbers out there, but all I want is yours. Boom. There you go. Or don't use it at all, okay? All right. So there are eight million possible ways to make your phone number. Okay. In the year 2009, Texas introduced a new license plate that used the pattern letter, letter, number, letter, number, number, number. Before exclusions, how many possible orderings are available in this format? So this means that we have to think of the alphabet and there are 26 letters in the alphabet. So we get 26 choices for the first letter, 26 choices for the second letter. We're only allowed to use the numbers zero through nine again for our license plate. So this means you have 10 choices for the first number. Then again, 26 choices for the third letter and then 10 choices for the last three numbers. So 10 choices for that first, second, and third number on the last. Which means, sum it up, we get 26 to the third times 10 to the fourth, and we get 175,760,000 possible choices to make a license plate. So be creative. Do they still make license plates in jail, or is that a TV thing? Uh, who knows? All right. Well, if so, you have 175 million ways to create it. All right. Last one, and then I'll make a separate video for 7.4. Since this video was just so out of whack. Awful. Okay. A small combination lock has three wheels, each labeled with the 10 digits from zero to nine. How many three-digit combinations are possible if digits can be repeated? So this means that you can use the same number for your combo, which means you have 10 choices for the first number, 10 choices for the second number, 10 choices for the third number, which means you have a thousand possible ways to make a combo with the same numbers if you don't want if you want them to repeat. Okay. B, how many three-digit combinations are possible if no digit is repeated? Okay, so this means you cannot repeat a digit. You can't repeat a number. So this means that there are 10. <laughs> so this, <laughs> this means that there are 10 choices for the first number, nine choices for the second number, and eight choices for the third number. So this means you have 720 possible choices if no digit is repeated. Okay, which means, yes, you can't use the same number as the first and the same number as the second. All right, how many three-digit combinations are possible if successive digits must be different? You have 10 choices for the first number, which means if the successive digit must be different, this means the second number can't be the same as the first, so you only have nine choices for the second number. But then after that, the next number can be different from the one in the middle, but it can be the exact same as the first number. So you still have 10 choices again. So this means you have 900 possible ways to make a combo if your digits, uh, if your success, successive digits must be different. Whew. All right. So that is sets and counting principles. I, again, will make a separate video for 7.4 after I restart all my computers. Okay, that's it.